Hey, Daisy, Eli. It is awesome to, uh, to get to meet with you guys today. Uh, just as a kind of a reintroduction, my name is Chell Lindgren. I'm a NASA astronaut. I joined uh, the astronaut office in 2009, and after several years of training, I had the opportunity to fly. In the wow. fall of 2015, I launched from Kazakhstan on a Russian rocket to the International Space Station, and I spent 141 days living and working in low Earth orbit. It was an absolutely phenomenal experience. I got to do two spacewalks. I saw over 200 different experiments while we were up there, and uh, I got to realize this dream, lifelong dream of living and working in space uh, for an extended period of time. Um, it was a phenomenal experiment and or, a phenomenal experience. And I'm really excited to get to, to share that with you today. Now, I understand that you you looked at some of the, the videos that are online on YouTube and, and had a chance to, to, to look at that playlist. What, what did you think? Anything kind of stand out to you all? Wow. Yeah. Um, just wow. I guess I thought the coffee thing was interesting because I like coffee and the lettuce. The calf, of course. Those two things. Yeah. Awesome. So a lot of people will ask me, you know, what were my favorite experience, experiments were, and and those two were my favorites. So capillary <laughs> coverage and veggie. And so people have to come to their own conclusions that the science that I was interested in was, was the science where I got to eat and drink stuff. But... Uh, <laughs> But yeah, those were a lot. Of, <clears throat> excuse me, those were a lot of fun to be a part of. Yeah, and, you know, I got to to tend to these plants um, on a day to day basis, and you know, people love to garden, and it was amazing to get to garden in space to see these plants grow. And when you think about the space station and some of those videos, you can see that it's a fairly kind of sterile environment, just white paint and, and aluminum, and so to see this uh, this green. Um, plant growing in that uh, environment was a lot of fun. And then to get to to eat fresh food at the end of it, yeah. that was pretty cool. So, and then coffee. So you like coffee. That's, that's, uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Getting started early. Yeah. So I, I love coffee and uh, I was a little bit worried about the coffee situation on orbit. And so yeah. I worked with the fluid dynamics team at Portland State University and they were doing a, an experiment called capillary beverage where they were actually looking at how fluids can move in space without using electricity or um, power. And just using the, the geometry of a cup, they were able to allow fluids to move through capillary motion. And we harnessed that geometry to allow fluids to move um, so that we could drink from an open cup in space without gravity to kind of help pour that fluid. And, and so I used that cup to, to brew some fresh coffee in space and that was awesome. <laughs> What other questions do you have from, from what you saw? I have one. So I was, uh, well, I was, while I was watching the videos of like your entire trip, I noticed that your, your hair was about the same the entire time. And I was like, how do you cut your hair? Cause wouldn't the hair just float all over the ship? Or is that's, there like a vacuum? That's a really good point. And I think it's something that um, folks are starting to, a problem that people are starting to encounter now that, uh, we're you know, staying at home for the most part is like, how do you, how do you get a haircut? And it turns out for me that uh, I was in the air force before I uh, joined NASA and I used to get my haircut um, every other week. And then when I separated from the air force and went to medical school, um, I still liked having short hair, but I could not afford to pay somebody to cut my hair every two weeks. And so I bought some clippers and I learned how to cut my own hair. And so I've been doing that for, for 20 years. And when we got in on the space station, um, I was able to cut my hair there up there as well. So we have clippers uh, for, for folks that like to keep their hair short. We have clippers and those actually hook into a vacuum. And so just as you pointed out, we definitely do not want to just cut hair and have that going everywhere. Yeah. Because it's going to get in people's eyes. They're going to breathe it in. And so we vacuum that hair up right away, that, just as it's being cut off. And, and, uh, and so that was very familiar to me. So I, I cut my own hair with, when I was up there, and people saw that, you know, I kind of knew what I was doing. So they asked if I would cut their hair too. And I was happy to do that. Um, they're in one of my videos, it shows kind of before and after pictures. And uh, what they didn't know is that I only know one haircut. And so everybody got my haircut while we were on, on the space station. Awesome. Yeah. Good question. What other questions do you have? Um, I guess this one is probably asked a lot, but like, how did the lettuce taste? Yeah, great question. 
Uh, it tasted like lettuce. So that's a good thing. Mm. Um, if it had not tasted like lettuce, then I had done something really wrong as we were growing, growing yeah. out of lettuce. Um, but it was really great to, to be able to taste fresh food. We actually have some, had some, um, uh, stuff that we could make kind of a salad dressing with, uh, some oil and balsamic vinegar. And we put that on the lettuce and it tasted, uh, so it tasted great. And there's something that's really neat about fresh food, of course, that, you know, it smells, it tastes fresh, it has a, a good texture. And that's not something that we, you know, after you've been up on the space station for two, three, four months, you're starting to get, you're starting to get used to the, the food that we have up there. And all of that food, we don't really cook in space. All of our food is prepared on the ground and then sealed in packets. It's either sealed and then exposed to, to radiation or to high temperatures to kill off the bacteria, or it's uh, sealed and de it's dehydrated and sealed. And so we add hot water, or cold water to, to rehydrate that food. And we warm that food up, just open up the envelopes, and then we eat it. So, so there isn't really a lot of cooking. Um, and to so ha have something fresh, something that was a, just a basic ingredient, just lettuce, uh, was, was really cool. And, and sometimes in our cargo vehicles, in addition to bringing up um, equipment and supplies, uh, some of that uh, shelf-stable food or clothes, sometimes they'll have a fresh food container. Or in the event that um, they're bringing science up that needs refrigeration, sometimes they'll put uh, food in there that, uh, that we can keep cold. And so some of our crews in the past, <clears throat> excuse me, have gotten a surprise ice cream um, or, or other treats for them to share when it gets up there. During our mission, we had a Japanese cargo vehicle called HTV arrive on the space station. And in addition to all the supplies that it brought up, uh, we got um, oranges and lemons and grapefruit. And so that was amazing to, to eat in space. Wow. I can't imagine living without like oranges. And that's something that's pretty different, right? That uh, yeah. here on earth, if you need something, you run out of you know food or you run out of uh, t-shirts or something like that. Um, for the most part, you can just kind of sneak out to the store and get it. And for us on the space station, we are absolutely reliant on the cargo vehicles that are coming to resupply us. And so we have a whole teams of people on the ground that are really planning all those supplies, all the things. If a piece of equipment breaks, making sure that we have a spare equipment on the space station, whole teams that are really dedicated to that. And, uh, and so it really kind of underscores the idea that living and working in space is a team effort that we have the privilege as the astronauts and the crew have the privilege of being up there and doing the experiments and doing the work. But we have this amazing team, not just in Houston, but in Huntsville and all over the world that are supporting those efforts um, to do science and uh, to explore. Were there ever any emergencies? Like, did somebody ever get hurt or they're like tether snapped on a spacewalk or anything like that? Yeah, so um, we train for those emergencies. We spend probably a, a larger, uh, we spend a large proportion of our training preparing for those emergencies simply because if they happen, we have to know what to do immediately. And we don't really have a lot of time to figure out uh, what we need to do. And so um, we train for those emergencies. And the big emergencies that we're really concerned about on the space station are uh, fire, depressurization. So the space station holds an atmosphere, a sea level atmosphere that provides oxygen at the right amount of pressure for us to be able to breathe, to survive. And then the third really big one is toxic atmosphere. So some chemical that is um, released into the, the atmosphere of the space station. And so uh, we train um, constantly on how to respond to those major three emergencies. Um, <clears throat> and then and it's very similar to, you know, in your school's training for a fire drill. You know, you don't want people to panic. You want people to respond thoughtfully and uh, quickly to that. And so everybody understands when they hear the fire drill, hey, we're gonna go to our designated place. We're gonna make sure we got all of the, all, everybody in the class, we have a designated path that we're gonna follow and we're gonna do a count outside and wait for, for the firefighters to arrive. And for us, it's very similar. You know, if we have a fire, the first thing we're gonna do is make sure that everybody knows that there's a fire. And if the alarm hasn't already gotten off, we're gonna push, push a button. 
And then we're going to gather everybody together, make sure that we've got a good head count. And then we're going to get to a safe place on the space station and get into the procedures and start to uh, start working on our response to, to an emergency like a fire. Um, for our mission, we did not have any major emergencies, but we do occasionally, and, and, and every mission is, is like this, we do occasionally have um, the alarms go off. Most of the time it's because of a false smoke alarm. And one of the issues in space is that most of our smoke alarms uh, detect particles, smoke particles. And so if we're cleaning, if we're using the vacuum cleaner to clean, that can suck dust past the smoke alarm and cause a false alarm. And so that actually gives us good practice to hear the alarm, start our emergency response, and then confirm that it's actually just a, a false alarm and to go from there. We did have one incidence where a piece of machinery, I think, was starting to overheat and that kicked off a smoke alarm and we respond to, responded to it perfectly and, and it was no big deal. Um, for the space box, we didn't have an emer any emergencies, but, uh, but just uh, but we certainly train for those and, and uh, we don't want to ever have a snapped tether or, or something like that could, that could put somebody's lives in danger. Yeah. Yep. Davey? Um, I guess, how do you sleep? Yeah. So I think one of the interesting things about living on the International Space Station is that it's a lot like uh, it's a lot like camping. Um, I'm I'm a for, uh, an Eagle Scout. My sons are in Boy Scouts, and it's been a lot of fun to talk with them and the other Scouts about how uh, camping is very similar to being on the space station. So one, we don't have running water, so you, there's no way to take a shower, um, no way to use running water to wash your hands. We have we actually use disinfectant wipes to wash our hands when we go when we do hygiene. It's basically getting, it's kind of like a sponge bath. You get a, a washcloth or a, a towel wet with a little bit of soap and water, and that's how you clean yourself off. Um, sleeping is a lot like camping. We have, a, we have a, a crew quarters, and it's about the size of a small closet. And it turns out that it's the perfect amount of room to have for just kind of a private space. It's a place where we sleep. It's a place where we just have private time to be able to talk on the phone to our families, to read and answer emails, to read a book. Um, and so for sleeping, we actually have sleeping bags. And those uh, float, or, so you can either secure those to the wall, actually tie them to the back of the wall, or you can let them free float. <laughs> when I um, first arrived at the space station, a lot of people will say that they miss that sensation of having something kind of pushing them on your back as if you were laying in bed. And so a lot of people will tack all four corners of their sleeping bag against the wall. So when they get in, they can feel the wall against their back. And I did that for the first couple of nights and I just didn't really sleep very well. So I decided to just let my sleeping bag free float. I would tie one cord to the wall just so the sleeping bag wouldn't float away. But I would get into my sleeping bag, zip it up. And then in my sleeping bag, I would just float around inside my crew quarters. And I thought that, that that worked great for me. I slept really well, and <clears throat> I kind of compare it to sleeping on a cloud. It's really kind of hard to describe because you don't have that pressure of something on your on your back. But again, I, I slept very well. Yeah, because like even on Earth, if you had like cords to make it like you were actually there was nothing on your back, the tension would still be like the sleeping bag with the thing on your back. There would be really no way to do that on earth except coughing you up in the air really high with a sleep. Yeah, that's right. So <laughs> you hit a great, uh, a great point, Eli, that there is really no way to practice a lot of this stuff on the earth. You know, we are always in gravity and there are ways to kind of simulate weightlessness. Uh, sometimes we'll use a plane flying parabolic arcs. And so when the plane flies up and then the plane starts to fly downward and it flies at the same rate that the person inside is falling, we get, to sense what white weightlessness feels like for about 20 seconds at a time. But it's hard to practice sleeping in that environment. And so there are a lot of things, even though we train for several years for these missions, there are a lot of things that we don't actually get to experience until we get on the space station and, uh, and do um, at the time. And so sleeping is one of those things. You kind of have to figure it out. And so that's kind of how I started. I decided, you know, I'd try it with that pressure on my back. And some people will even crumple up a t-shirt or something and put it underneath their head to kind of make it feel like that there's a pillow there. 
And like I said, you know, that worked okay for it, was, but it wasn't great. And so I found that just free floating in my, in my crew quarters worked, worked awesome. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, I saw like a space book cause we had like a card of space books and uh -huh. it said like a lot of people practiced underwater. Yeah. That yeah, that's a great. That's a great point. So we have a special pool at uh, here at Johnson Space Center called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. Um, it is a massive, massive pool. It is 40 feet deep. I think it's got like six million gallons of water in it, and it is big enough to hold a mock-up, a model of the International Space Station. Now, not in its kind of full width and length, but various pieces of it, the important pieces of the space station. And so we'll actually use that pool, that neutral buoyancy laboratory, to practice doing spacewalks. And so um, we call it neutral buoyancy because once we get into the pool in our suits, we have a team of divers that will come and use foam and, and, uh, and weights to make us neutrally buoyant. So, you know, when you jump into a swimming pool, if you have a full, your lungs are full of air, you'll tend to kind of float up at the top. And then if you breathe out all that air, uh, you might be able to kind of sink down towards the bottom, right? Well, we do something kind of similar to that. Of course, we're not holding our breath. We use those weights and foam so that we float right in the middle. Um, and the divers kind of set us up so that also that if we turn upright or turn down, that we'll kind of stay in those positions. So um, what that allows us to do is to really kind of understand how that spacesuit works and how to use the tools that we need to use, how to move around, how to position our bodies so that we can do the work on the outside of the space station. And that training is critically important. We would not be successful at doing spacewalks without that training. And we discovered that very early on in our very first spacewalks, we discovered that we needed to be able to practice doing, um, doing work outside because it is non-intuitive and it's very challenging. And so having that opportunity to practice in the pool is really important. Now you still feel gravity in the pool. So if you turn yourself sideways, you feel like you're laying in your suit. If you turn upside down, it's uncomfortable because all the blood goes up to, to the top of your head. Um, and so we tend to stay kind of upright in the pool, but again, it's really, really important training. Um, in fact, I was just in the neutral buoyancy laboratory uh, last Friday and spent, we do six hours, we get into the suit, and we're underwater doing work for six hours. And so that's great practice for, for when we do our actual spacewalks. How do you get your air when you're down there? Yeah, great question. You know, our spacesuits themselves are self-contained. These are absolutely amazing pieces of technology, amazing engineering. They are miniature spacecraft that, that we wear. Um, it provides... Uh, there's no umbilical from the spacesuit to the space station that pr that's providing power or oxygen or scrubbing carbon dioxide. All we are attached to are tethers to hold us to make sure that we don't float away. Um, and so that sp that little spacecraft, that spacesuit, provides the oxygen, the pressure, the cooling, um, the heat rejection, everything that we need to to not only survive to be able to do work uh, outside of the space station. Now the the spacesuits in the pool are just a little bit different. They're still the full spacesuits, but instead of having a backpack that provides all of those functions, we actually do have umbilicals, hoses that are attached to the spacesuit to provide that oxygen and pressure and cooling that we need um, inside the spacesuit, inside the pool. And so our diver, our dive team actually helps us with that. We don't worry about the umbilicals. They manage the umbilicals for us so that all we're concerned about is moving around where we needed to get to go and doing the work that we need to do. Great question. Um, uh, I have three things and two yeah. of them, one of them is an actual question. Is it fun being in the pool? You know what? That's a, that's an, that's a terrific and very insightful question. Um, the very first time that I got into the spacesuit to get into the pool, and it's a little bit of a shorter run. So our normal runs are six hours long. I think this was maybe four hours. Um, it's very much a adaptation run. It was to understand what it's like to be in the suit. But that first time I put that spacesuit on and it was being lowered to the pool, that was a huge, huge deal for me. Um, to me, it really kind of represented this, you know, I've really, I'm really doing it. I'm here, I'm doing this thing that is, that is, uh, 
a big part of what it means to be an astronaut. And so I was absolutely uh, overwhelmed with excitement and joy to be doing this. And then 30 minutes later, I was exhausted. Um, <laughs> I was wiped out and a huge part of that. So it is really challenging. Training in the pool and actually doing a spacewalk is one of the most challenging things that I've ever done. Mentally, you are focused, especially when you're doing a real spacewalk. Your focus is entirely on what you're doing. You're not thinking about anything else because every place you put your hand, you've got to make sure that there isn't some metal there that's sharp from like a micrometeorite strike that you could cut your glove on. You're constantly monitoring your tethers to make sure that you're that you're not disconnected from the space station. You're constantly looking at your equipment to make sure that things don't float away. So that is mental focus for six, seven hours. And then physically, every time you move, because the space suit is pressurized, every time you move, you're moving against um, resistance. So opening and closing your hands requires work. And so it's kind of like using one of those exer hand exercisers. With every time that you move yourself around, Every time you engage a tether, use a tool, that's six hours of doing hand exercises. And man, I was wiped out after 30 minutes. And so that's what the training is for, is to really understand how to conserve that energy, how to be efficient, and uh, so that you can work for six, seven hours in the spacesuit uh, and do a real spacewalk. And so to answer your question, it is a lot of fun. Um, it's incredibly challenging, uh, and hard work, and it's even more fun when it's done. When you look back and you've done that's either the training event in the pool or done the spacewalk safely, you've been successful at the work that you needed to do, and uh, and that's a lot of fun to, to reflect upon. Um, so the second one was the blood only rushes to your head when you're on Earth because there's almost no gravity in space. So you can, in like the International Space Station, you can get like there's a way to walk in every direction or is That's it your absolutely right. way? Yeah. You, so we'll come back to kind of where the blood rush is in space, but on the earth, if you were going to do work, say um, on the baseboards where the, the wall meets the floor, like if you had to do something down there, you kind of got to maybe lay on your stomach or you're going to crouch down to do that. Right. And space you can just flip upside down and then so that it's you're working like this, which it might be a little more comfortable. Or you can turn sideways. You can position your body however you want to do the work that you need to do. Say you needed to do something on the overhead. We have, we have equipment and storage even on the ceiling. And so instead of kind of reaching up like this, I would just float up and then orient myself as if I was walk, working on a wall. And so it takes your brain a little bit of time to get used to that concept of, that you can position your body any way that you need to, um, to do the work that you need to do. And, and it takes, I think it takes most of us about four to six weeks to feel like we've really become uh, adapted to that environment and feel like that we're working at 100% efficiency. Yeah. And you asked about the blood rushing to your face if you turned upside down on earth course it's not going anywhere you can go in any direction and, and the blood is not going to rush but one of the interesting things that occurs physiologically when we go into space is that we do have a shift of the fluid that is usually down in our legs up into our chest and head and so here's why that happens um, on earth when you stand up all the blood rushes wants to pool down into your legs gravity's pulling on all that blood and your heart starts to beat a little bit faster and stronger, your mu leg muscles squeeze, and that pressurizes that fluid column um, that, so that the blood keeps going to your brain and keeps your brain working. And you may have sensed sometime if you stood up too fast and things get a little bit gray, uh, it's because your blood, your, your, your heart's just not quite kept up just yet, and so you steady yourself for a minute and then you're okay. When you get into space, there is no gravity pulling down on that blood, but all of those physiologic functions, your heart beating, um, the, your leg muscles, all those things continue to work. And what that actually happens is it pushes the fluids in your body up into your chest and head. And so if you may have noticed that in a lot of the footage that you saw on YouTube, that my face was a lot puffier. 
Um, and that's because that fluid goes up into your head and chest. So we tend to feel very congested. Our heads feel full. And if you were to look at our legs, they look super, super skinny. We call them bird legs. They look really funny. And, uh, and that's from that fluid shift that occurs. And that stays with you. It gets a little bit better, but it stays with you the entire time that you're up there. And it's a little, it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, so my last one was in the video with the coffee in the uh, in the cap in the capillary uh, coffee cup. Yeah, you spun around. Was that just like completely on accident? Like you were just like turning and you just turned around, and or were were you just like turning around because like how sensitive is is the gravity? So, um, well, of course there is. We don't feel gravity up there. Uh, it's, it's weightless. And so one of the fun things is that I probably was spinning around like that um, just for fun. And so you'll find that you'll just kind of do things uh, that you can't do here for fun. I remember one night I was talking with my crewmate, uh, Kimia. The workday was done. We were just hanging out in, the, in node one where the food is and just chatting. It was that area where you, we filmed ourselves with the coffee. And you'll just be sitting there talking and we have bungee cords on the floor and handrails on the floor. And we tuck our feet underneath those just to keep in, in one position. And oftentimes you'll stick your foot underneath a bungee cord and you'll just bounce up and down. And it's just kind of one of those things that's fun to do. Or while you're talking, you might just do a back flip or a forward flip. Um, and it's really cool. And just to see if you can do it without bumping into anything. Um, it's just one of those fun things uh, to do. And as we were spinning around, you could kind of see how the coffee was sloshing out a little bit uh, from kind of uh, inertia or centrifugal force. One of the interesting things to do is if you get a bag, like I had a bag of chocolate covered pretzels from the station. And if you open the bag up and you're not careful, everything will just, if like if I were to open the bag up and then just tap it upward a little bit, all those pretzels would come flying out and it would make a big mess. And you, the most important thing is that you might lose some of those pretzels and you don't want to. <laughs> Pocket covered pretzels, right? Um, so something that you can do is actually flip the bag outward so that the it's facing towards you, and then you just spin around. And by doing that, again, centrifugal force is pushing, pulling everything down towards the bottom of the bag. So you open the bag, you start to spin a little bit, you open it, stick your hand in there, grab something, close it, and then you can stop spinning. And that's one way you can force everything down towards the bottom uh, to grab something without everything coming out. Wow. I to you that while floating and weightlessness is absolutely amazing and a lot of fun, it makes everything just a little bit challenging. And that's one of those things is just open in a bag of chips. If you're not careful, everything flies everywhere. And so you got to figure out little strategies to. Unless you're like having a party and then there's excuses. Cause... <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You can just. Thanksgiving. Chocolate chips for everybody. everybody. <laughs> The problem is, is that uh, we have to clean up afterwards too. So, right. so to not a dusty thing, like I guess. What's uh, not like Dorito. Anything not like Dorito. Right. Like something frozen. You can like Doritos and Dorito dust will go like everywhere. That's a great point. And our food lab actually is very concerned about that stuff. And so we tend not to be allowed to have foods in space that that are very crumbly or dusty because, you know. Some uh, icy dust from uh, from a tortilla chip, for example, if that were floating around and got into my into our eyes, that would that would sting pretty bad. And so we try to be very careful um, with uh, with the food that we're eating. We got to be careful with. So our drink bags look a lot like Capri Suns. They're like aluminum envelopes. We stick a straw into them, and you got to be careful with those too, because if you put a little pressure and you don't have a little pincher lock on the top, that stuff goes flying. And so the ceiling in our galley is actually pretty disgusting with just like droplets of coffee and juice and soup. Uh, splatter, splatter on. So I think that we've got time for maybe one more question. Baby, oh. you want to go ahead? Um, so it's your turn. <laughs> uh, I guess, oh, um, you, you do it. I can't think of any. How do you go to the bathroom? A simple question that everybody asks. Oh, I, ha I just thought of one. Shoot. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, Daisy. Uh, after you exercise all day on the ship, 
do you start exercising more when you get on land or do you just like, who knows? Yeah, so we have two hours set aside for exercise every day on the space station. And that's really important for us because it, uh, if we weren't to exercise, if, if we didn't exercise, then being in weightlessness is a lot like just laying flat in bed. So imagine laying flat in bed for 141 days. That means you're not standing up. That means you're not putting, you know, gravity isn't um, working on your body and pulling you down. And so every time you step, every time you go upstairs, you're exercising those muscles and you're putting impact forces on your bones and your bones are remodeling and healing and growing and, and staying healthy. Um, when you don't stand up and gravity isn't, gravity isn't pulling on, on uh, that blood. And so your heart doesn't have to react to make sure that your brain is staying perfused. And so our hearts would become, our cardiovascular systems would become deconditioned. Um, our uh, bones would become weakened and our muscles would atrophy and wither. And so we exercise uh, every day to make sure that doesn't happen. We have an exercise machine called the Advanced Resistive Exercise Device. Um, it's like a universal gym using evacuated cylinders. So there's no weight in space. And so we use evacuated cylinders to provide up to 600 pounds of resistance. We have an exercise bike and then also a treadmill. And the treadmill in particular, again, we have to wear a harness with bungee cords that pull us down onto the treadmill. Because if we didn't, that first step, we would go flying up towards the ceiling. So yeah, and that, and it, that wouldn't work so well. So we have three exercise devices. And then when we get back to earth, we have uh, reconditioning specialists um, that day one after getting back from Earth, they have us in the in our athletic facility uh, doing exercises to help us recover our balance and um, our coordination. Now, most of us are as strong, if not stronger, and our cardiovascular systems are as fit, if not fitter, than when we left. But that gravity element still takes a while to get used to. And a big part of that is that neurovestibular, the balance part. So we, while we're very strong, we tend to be very clumsy and off balance. And so getting back into the gym and exercising helps helps to um, speed up that recovery process a little bit. And then Eli, you asked about going to the bathroom. So uh, great question, you know, it's super important. The first day, the, within the first hour of getting to, onto the space station, uh, the commander will take us through our emergency responses just to review where all the emergency equipment is, um, <clears throat> just as a reminder. And then we go over where, the, how to, how to use the bathroom in space again, um, where to get water, and where you sleep. Those are kind of the three big issues uh, for for living in space. And so, uh, going to the bathroom. We separate uh, liquid waste and solid waste. And so you probably have a vacuum that has a kind of a hose extension on it in your house. So that is where the liquid waste goes. We don't have gravity, so we have to use suction uh, to collect that waste. And, and so the urine, that, so that liquid waste gets pulled into a, a, uh, into a hose that goes into a, um, a processing unit called the urine processing. Uh, apparatus, and then that goes to the water processor, and that goes to our I water. I read about that, yeah. yeah. So um, it's critically important, right? We, especially as we look to going to returning to the moon and then going on to Mars, there's no way it is impossible to bring all the water that we need to support a crew of four to six for a long period of time. So we have to get good at recycling. And this is technology, so we need to be able to clean that liquid waste and return it to a drinkable, uh, a clean and drinkable form. And this is really important because there are places around the earth that don't have access to, uh, to clean drinking water. And so it's technology like this that can help us um, provide clean drinking water in, in those areas as well. Uh, it does take a little while to get used to the idea of uh, drinking your uh, recycled uh, urine. <laughs> When you've gotten there, then it takes a little bit longer to get used to the idea that you're not only drinking your recycled urine, but you're drinking the rest of the crew's uh, recycled urine as well. Yeah. Um, but the water actually tastes great, and, uh, and it works really well. The solid waste also, so we have a, a system that looks kind of like a toilet um, with a seat, and uh, basically um, in that seat, instead of water at the bottom of the toilet, 
there's a little baggie with small holes in it. So air gets pulled through that baggie, it captures the solid waste, that gets wrapped up and dropped into the, a bin, that bin gets sealed up and, and then uh, put on one of our cargo vehicles that's returning to the earth that burns up in the earth's atmosphere. And so that's how we get rid of that solid waste. So it's just destroyed? Everything yeah, on yeah, it's basically incinerated. Um, okay. So our atmosphere is partly made up of human waste. <laughs> cool. Yeah. And um, so was in one of the videos, there was a thing launching out of a like, like a shoot. Oh, yeah. Uh, was yeah, that the uh, cargo thing? Well, so what I think you're referring to, it looked like a long, kind of a long rectangular box. Yeah. Yeah. So we actually, that's a satellite, and we had the opportunity to launch satellites from the space station. So mm -hmm. we used a robotic arm to actually grab a satellite launcher and then positioned it in a way so that it wouldn't come back and hit the space station, you know, orbits later. But that's one way of de deploying satellites, very small satellites uh, from the space station. And a lot of those were experiments uh, that were built by students in universities and I think even high schools. And so that was a really neat way to, to share and engage in science with, uh, with students here back here on the earth. I think that's, uh, that's all the time that we've got. Hey, it has been awesome to, to get with, to chat with you. You guys had uh, really terrific questions. I hope uh, that the, the answers were educational for you and for the rest of the folks that, uh, that are gonna be watching this video. Um, thanks so much for the opportunity to chat with you. You're welcome. Thanks Bye. for coming. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye.